Just a mile and a half from the shores of downtown Miami and perched along a small channel on Virginia Key sits a beautiful piece of modernist architecture from a long, distant era. Since the early 1990s, this 6,500-seat marine stadium has sat abandoned and left to the harsh South Florida elements. Over the decades of sitting abandoned, it grew to become not only a notable abandoned structure covered in graffiti, but a historic one with a large movement to save the structure. But why did the stadium close in the first place, and how is it sat abandoned like this, surrounded by some of the most valuable real estate in Florida? What's up guys, my name is Jake, and in this 79th episode of Abandoned, let's take a look at the story of the Miami Marine Stadium. This episode of Abandoned is sponsored by Vessi. Check out Vessi Styles at Vessi.com slash BrightSunFilms and use the code BrightSunFilms for 15% off your order. It was the early 1960s, and the city of Miami was trying to figure out what to do with the land that had recently been donated. It was on the south end of Virginia Key, and this was at a time when Miami was keen on building out infrastructure that would allow them to become the world's capital for boat racing, a very popular sport in the area at the time. To achieve this, the city would build out a U-shaped cove just off the Miami South Channel, and a large paved area capable of holding 4,000 vehicles, temporary grandstands, restaurants, boat slips, and a massive permanent grandstand facility, able to seat over 6,500 people. This idea was very novel at the time, building out a purpose-built boat racing facility with a permanent viewing area and a somewhat controlled custom basin all just a stone throws away from downtown. Really, this idea is pretty novel now. In fact, this would be the first in the whole country. So, a study was submitted to the city, and once approved, construction began. Around $2 million was spent on the entire facility, close to $20 million today. What really stood out for this project, though, was the stadium itself. Designed by 28-year-old Hilario Candela, a Cuban immigrant, the structure was a beautiful example of modernist architecture of the time. With a speedy construction, on December 27, 1963, the stadium was dedicated to a famous boat driver and opened as the Ralph Middleton Monroe Miami Marine Stadium, simply known as the Miami Marine Stadium. The innovative structure was built on piers, jetting around half of the concrete grandstand out onto the water. With its flowing roof design and striking beams stretching the entire elevation, it was a proper tourist landmark for the city. It helped that the views of downtown Miami were abundant, as spectators would not only gain a perfect view of the performances out on the water, but also a spectacular view of the Miami cityscape. With the facility now open, events began to be scheduled several times a week. The motorboat races made front page news, and throughout the next few years, several highly publicized powerboat races would take place here, from the unlimited hydroplanes to an additional 16 boat classes. The sheer speed and the risk these drivers were putting themselves through was a dazzling spectacle tourists and locals just couldn't resist coming out to. But the Miami Marine Stadium was also a stadium, able to fit a decent number of people in a picturesque outdoor venue. So why not turn it into something like the Hollywood Bowl, but in Florida? Well, in 1965, the city crafted a barge that would act as a stage for live performances. Through the late 1960s, notable legends like The Who and Aretha Franklin performed at the stadium. In 1972, Richard Nixon took the stage for his presidential campaign, along with Sammy Davis Jr., who famously hugged him during the event. The stadium was also immortalized on the silver screen, with Elvis Presley's 1967 film Clambake hosting a climactic boat race in the cove. Artists like Queen, America, Ray Charles, Journey, and so many more performed here through the 1970s. The facility was a spectacular and now iconic landmark for the city, hosting some of the most iconic live performances in all of Florida. But the tide was beginning to turn. Despite large performances like Jimmy Buffett in the early 1980s, the frequency of new concerts were in decline. But that wasn't the main issue here, since the facility was purpose-built for boat racing. However, races were also becoming more infrequent. In fact, the sport of high-speed boat racing as a whole was on the decline. 
The reality was that boat racing is just very dangerous. Several drivers had already been killed while racing at the Marine Stadium, and the number of spectators they drew became less and less. By the mid-1980s, the events only brought out those who were enthusiasts of the sport, rather than the general public. It also didn't help that a new stadium that could fit 75,000 people opened up in 1987. While the newly opened Joe Robbie Stadium was quite the distance away from downtown Miami, it became the logical choice to move headliner performances there. The Marine Stadium took a hit from this, and the same year saw the last major boat race to take place in the Cove. Only a few additional performances were held there through the early 1990s notably from Tony Bennett and Ray Charles. But then came an event that was very much unplanned. In 1992, Hurricane Andrew tore through South Florida, causing unimaginable damage. The concrete structure of the Marine Stadium seemed to have held up quite well, but upon further inspection from city engineers, the structure was deemed to be unsafe for human occupation. This was the final blow for the city. Strapped for cash due to the immense damage from the hurricane, they had little interest in making the necessary repairs to reopen a stadium already in financial decline. So the property began to sit unused and completely abandoned. Years had passed with no intervention, and with the city doing nothing to secure the building, the public began finding their way in. The vast concrete walls became a canvas for many, tagging almost every surface of the stadium, some with their name, others with genuine works of art. The structure became known for its graffiti and sort of an underground abandoned spot to easily visit and explore. To the outside world, especially those who remembered the stadium when it was open, they had all thought it was abandoned by everyone involved. But that wasn't entirely the case, as there were a few who cared about preserving it. In fact, in the early 2000s, a reassessment was done on the structure, and it turns out the stadium was in sound condition. This sparked new interest in preserving the building and protecting it from further decay or even demolition in general. To make matters even more desperate though, in mid-2007, the city unveiled their master plan for Virginia Key. With new development spanning the entire island, and the Marine Stadium missing from it. There was swift and clear opposition to this plan, and in 2008, an organization was formed called Friends of Miami Marine Stadium, a nonprofit with the sole purpose to save the structure. The organization was led by a few local members who saw value in the cultural significance of the structure, with one of the founding members none other than Hilario Candela the original architect. Others also agreed with their purpose, with the National Trust for Historical Preservation placing it as one of the most endangered historic places in America. By now, the city got the message, and in 2010, they unveiled their new master plan, which had now included the stadium. The plan was ultimately approved with funding set aside for restoration, but progress on this would only crawl along. Meanwhile, the stadium was continuing to be a safe haven for graffiti artists, as well as an intact, abandoned relic from the 1960s, painted over in an ever-evolving art display. The area around the facility was put to use, though, hosting some large events and even the Miami Boat Show on several occasions. During this time, the organization was desperately trying to find funding. Public money just wasn't materializing, so they had to turn to private donors to fund critical site surveys. By 2016, the most promising update was announced, when the city had finally locked down a plan and a timeline for restoration, approving the spending of $45 million in the form of revenue bonds. Revenue bonds are essentially just loans taken out from private investors that would be expected to be paid back in full by the income the project would generate. And in this case, the city would be hedging their bets that the Miami Marine Stadium would be a worthwhile public investment. By 2017, things were moving rather smoothly as an architect was brought on and concept art was crafted on what this renovation would look like. But since this was a city project, a bunch of formalities and decisions needed to be made by councils. For instance, in 2018, the city held an RFP, a request for proposals, similar to what I looked into with my documentary Closer Storm. In this case, though, the city was seeking out the right operator for the venue. All of this ate up a bunch of time, but the city was publicly showing that they were ready to move forward, announcing an opening date of August 2019. 
those who were advocating the preservation of the structure were also very excited when the National Registry of Historic Places added it that year. But there were also some speed bumps. The city cancelled negotiations with a potential operator twice, and as August 2019 came and went, nothing significant at the stadium had been done. Though security was now on site, meaning the graffiti haven it once was had now been sealed off and locked in place. On the public side of things, the messaging was that construction was apparently about to begin any day. But it wasn't that easy, as they found they needed to complete brand new studies on the pilings to ensure their engineering data was accurate. So that began. By now though, those revenue bonds, the primary source of money to restore the facility, had expired. This was in late 2021, and the city decided to defer renewing them to May of the next year. But May came and went, and the city decided to defer renewals indefinitely. So, while it seemed like the project was dead in the water once again, it actually wasn't. Uh, sort of. See, the nonprofit organization still had money from various grants over the years, and put them to use by getting to work in September 2022, replacing some of the pilings and reinforcing others. But this infrastructure work to the facility would eat up nearly all of the grants and donations they had. They would need millions, likely tens of millions more, to get the property anywhere near what the concepts called for. So that brings us to now. It's been a long road of false starts and red tape. It's been over 31 years since the closure of the stadium, and 15 years since the organization was formed to save it. It's gotta be pretty painful to see so much promise, so much money come through the door, only for it to literally expire because the paperwork took so long. But some work is being completed. Critical infrastructure that should literally set the foundation for a much larger restoration. And I think there's a lot of people eagerly awaiting this project to get completed and to experience this work of art in use once again. Sadly, Javerio Candela did pass away in January 2022. But his work is a testament on how great the structure was. Building something genuinely beautiful, but also a structure that has held up partially unmaintained for over 60 years in one of the harshest climates in America. I think the stadium should be saved, and I think it would be truly so special to see it in use once again. I can't even imagine how astonishing it must have been to see some of the greats perform there. But this landmark has a long road to go, and it likely won't get there without the city's help. There needs to be a lot of public and political interest to get this done. So now it's a question of if that's actually going to happen. While you may not be able to participate in a boat race here at the Miami Marine Stadium, or maybe you will, who knows, today's sponsor Vessi is kind of the perfect shoe to own for it. For all of us that are less acclimated to speedboat racing, Vessi is great for everyday use as they're not only stylish and very comfortable, but also waterproof. That's Vessi's special trick, and it's a pretty great one. We were literally walking through a running stream and dunking our shoes in a waterfall, and Vessi's shoes held up perfectly. So you can only imagine what the benefits of walking through a street on a rainy day or trekking through some muddy puddles on a hike, since another benefit to them is that they're also very easy to clean. Now obviously this isn't the first pair of shoes to invent waterproofing, and truthfully they do run a bit on the warm side because of this waterproofing fabric. But Vessi combines all of this in a mixture of comfort, style, and utility that makes them a pretty great value. They're also a Canadian company, and they're committed to some sustainable values, and I just really love them. If you want to grab your own, go check out Vessi Styles at Vessi.com slash Brightsonfilms, and use the code Brightsonfilms to get 15% off your order. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.